So we have another worship experience immediately following this. I want to get us out on time. So let's hasten right into our verses. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. I'll tell you in advance, our focal verse is sandwiched in between uh, these two verses, 6 and 8. Number 7 is where we want to focus. But let's read this now. As is our normal habit, we'll walk through the book quickly. Walk up through the first five or six verses to get to verse number 7. But let's read this now. To give it some context, this is Paul writing as he is approaching death's door. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought a good fight. But look at this here. Look at the second metaphor. This is what we're focusing. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now. Somebody say now. No, say it with power. Say now. Shall now. Now there is in store for me. This is not just for anybody. This is for the believer. There's in store for me a crown or garland of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let all of God's people say amen. Let's focus on verse number seven one more time. I have fought a good fight. He says, I ran trying to make 100 and I made it up in my mind that 99 and a half won't do. He says, I went all the way with this thing. I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Let's prayerfully consider the grace to finish. The grace to finish. The grace to finish. Father, we declare that these words are blessed in our hearing and in our reading and in our doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You could take your rest. Thank you for standing with me in reverence for God's word. The grace to finish. Second Timothy is a book written by the Apostle Paul. I won't spend a lot of time in the introduction of this book since we've dealt with it uh, a couple of times over the last three to four month, months. We've come from the book of 2 Timothy. So I'll highlight a few choice things out of the book. But I'll quickly say for those who don't know perhaps, 2 Timothy is a letter, an epistle, fancy way of saying a letter written by the Apostle Paul. This letter is one of four that we have in the New Testament that Paul writes to a specific individual. Other letters are written to churches in regions in specific locales. But this is one of the four letters that he writes to an individual by the name of Timothy. The uniqueness of their relationship is displayed by the fact this is the only letter that Paul writes to an individual twice. He writes to Philemon. He writes to different people. He writes letters to other individuals. But this is the only one that we see in the New Testament that he writes to someone twice. They had a unique relationship, a closeness with one another. And what I want you to see is not so much a letter from one individual to another, but a changing of the guard. A movement from one generation to the next. And in the midst of that movement, Paul gives this young man a charge. I don't know what it is with us. God does nothing by coincidence. I don't plan these things. I don't want you to think I'm so deep that I plan all of these things. But God has just been dealing with us in the area of charges, it seems like lately. And specifically the charge of one generation to the next. 
how Moses, about a month or six weeks ago, how Moses passed away. And God gave a charge to Joshua for the next generation to possess the land. Then we talked about David as he was getting ready to pass away. And he gives a charge to Solomon, the next leader, a couple of weeks ago. Well, now today another charge is coming from the Apostle Paul to the next generation of Christian leadership to the pastor, Timothy. And he gives them this charge, and the whole book itself is a charge. But even in the midst of this one large charge that is the epistle of 2 Timothy, there are a series of subcharges or mini charges in the midst of this one large charge. You can find a different charge concerning the gospel in each chapter of this letter in 2 Timothy. And each charge concerning the gospel has its own basis. Y'all pray with me here this morning. I'm moving quick on purpose. Now, now each chapter has a charge concerning the gospel. And each charge in that chapter has its own basis. We won't go through all of them for the sake of time, but I'll just give you the charges for each chapter. In chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, you see the charge to, watch this, guard the gospel. The charge, perhaps you want to write these down or memorize them. The charge to guard the gospel. The charge in chapter 1, there's only four because there's only four chapters, so it won't be a lot. The charge to guard guard the gospel. You'll see this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's read at verse number 13. Uh, we're at number 2 in verse number 14. You got me, media? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13 and verse number 14. I'm on number 2, and then we'll follow from there. It says, I have 2 Timothy chapter 1. Chapter 1, yes, verse number 13. It says, what you have heard from me. This is the apostle saying, I taught you, Timothy. Now, what you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Watch this, verse number 14. Guard the good deposits that was entrusted to you. Guard the gospel. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard the good deposit. I'm just waiting for somebody to press silent at some point. But guard. They must be in the restroom. Guard the good deposit. That was entrusted to you. So it is not so much about me giving you something if you don't guard what I've given you. You see this in, in scripture where Jesus talked about this. Everybody hears good sermons every week. But the issue is not about hearing the word. It's about being doers of the word and not allowing the cares of this world, Jesus said, and the deceitfulness of riches and other things to pluck the seed of the word out of your heart. Every week we gather together so God can give you a deposit. Once you receive the deposit, it's up to you to guard the deposit. And so he says to him, God, I charge you to guard the gospel. Guard the deposit I've given to you. Chapter 2, he says the charge to suffer for the gospel. The charge to suffer for the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. Look what he says here. I charge you to guard the gospel. Now I charge you to suffer for the gospel. Look at this charge. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Look at this here. Watch this chart. Join me in suffering like a good soul. How large will our churches be 
if we opened up the doors of the church every single weekend and our emphasis is not so much on what Jesus can do for you. He can help you with a myriad of problems. Get out of debt. Help your marriage. Help your parent. Help your children. Get you off of drugs. And he can do all of those things. But I think what we fail to recognize is that the call to Christ to some degree is a call to suffer. If anybody knows about this, it would be the author of this letter and of this book because when God calls the apostle Paul, he does not call him under the promise that I will cancel all of your debts. He does not call him under the promise, you are single, Paul, but if you walk with me, I'm going to give you a woman after my own heart to be your wife. He does not call him under the promise that every church that you have will succeed and multiply. He does not call him under the promise of daisies and roses and lilies, but he says, Paul, I have selected you to suffer for my name. What a call that is. I have selected you. Many of you probably already forgot the sermon. We dealt with it a couple of years ago over the pandemic where we preached on selected to suffer. How many of us would run into the ministry, run into the church, run up to the aisle, every, the altar every single week if our call says come to Jesus just as you are and he will not put a crown of righteousness on you just yet. That is to come. But for now, a crown of thorns may adorn your head. Hardship will face you. Trouble and trauma and trial will be your name. I have selected you to suffer for my name. And he says, I charge you now just as I have suffered for the sake of the gospel. Timothy, as I give this, 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 this treasure this trust to you, I charge you now to suffer for my name. So you must guard the gospel, I charge you. Chapter 2, you must suffer for the gospel. Chapter 3, I charge you to continue in the gospel. Continue in the gospel. Guard the gospel. Suffer for the gospel. Now I charge you to continue. In the gospel. Look what he says here in chapter 3. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, do what? Continue. I need the church to wake up. Do what? Continue. Do what? Continue. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. So it's one thing to get it. <laughs> but it's another thing to continue. It's one thing to start something. I'm going to preach by the time y'all wake up in just a second, but I'm going to step through here anyway. It's one thing to start something, but it's another thing to continue into something. Continue in it. Continue in it. Continue in what you have learned in her. See, because 2 Timothy chapter 3 is unique. We dealt with this a few months back because he opens the chapter by talking about attitudes and behaviors that are indicative of a last day people. So he says, in the last days, perilous, perilous, times of peril will come. Difficult times will come. And he says the attitude and the behavior of people in this generation, the hallmark of it will be they will not want to hear truth. Perilous times will come. And he says, what you're going to do, I'll skip over to chapter 4, I'll come back to 3. And he'll say, what you're going to do in chapter 3 in these perilous times, you're going to have to know what it means just to continue. <laughs> continue when it doesn't look like it's working continue when it doesn't look like it's going anywhere continue when it seems like there's no addition just subtraction continue though in the natural eye everything seems to be wasting away but inwardly you're being renewed day by day so just continue in it do it when you don't get any results do it when nobody gets saved do it when nobody's coming to church do it when nobody wants to join the ministry do it when you don't have any volunteers but as for you, continue. 
so I charge you, suffer for the gospel. I charge you to continue to preach the gospel. I charge you, chapter number two, to continue to guard, one, to guard the gospel. Guard the gospel. Suffer for the gospel. Continue in the gospel. Guard the gospel. Suffer for the gospel. Continue in the gospel. Then chapter 4, he says, I charge you, watch this, to preach the gospel. Chapter number 1, I challenge you to guard the gospel. Chapter number two, I charge you to suffer for the gospel. Chapter three, I charge you to continue in the gospel. Chapter four, I charge you to preach the gospel. If you've ever been to an ordination service or a licensing of ministers, you'll see this word in, in this message, in this, in this scripture read, where it says, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom I give you this come on wake up I give you this I give you this charge what's the charge verse number two preach the word be prepared in season and out of season in other words for the minister be prepared when they call your name but be prepared when they don't. Be prepared when they call your name. And be prepared. Be prepared when you don't have any calls for an itinerant ministry. Be prepared when nobody seems to know your name. You can be like Jeremiah and think I'm going home and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to quit. But if you are truly called to this work, the word of God will burn in you like a fire. A fire shut up in your bone. So any good minister worth a grain of salt knows this word. Preach the word. Be prepared. I charge you to guard it. I charge you to suffer for it. I charge you to continue in it. And he says, I charge you to preach it. Why is this charge to preach so important? Because as I stated, as he makes this turn in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, the book turns toward the end times. It takes its turn toward eschatology. It takes its turn toward the thoughts and the ideas, as I said, that are indicative of a last day people. And he says, the hallmark of the generation, the basis of my charge is, number one, you're going to live in an era, or maybe write this down, where people aren't going to want to hear truth. I'm not going to give you the basis of the charge in every single chapter. Go read them for yourself. You'll find them. But he has three basis for the, his charge in chapter number four. He says it. Go back to verse number one, please, and we'll walk up to seven. He says the basis for this charge to preach the gospel is found in three places. He says, in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. Watch this. In view of his appearing. So what's the basis of my charge to tell you to preach? Number one, Jesus is coming back. You need to preach because Jesus is coming back in view of his appearing. The basis of the charge to preach is by the simple fact Jesus is going to return. Then he goes on in verse number two. He said, let's keep reading, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Look at this, correct, every part of preaching from a pastoral perspective will include this, correct, rebuke, but don't just leave the people there, Timothy, encourage. I should never preach to you so much where I beat you down, where you don't leave with a sense of encouragement. Encouragement. You should never leave with a sense of hopelessness. I would, I would venture to say you have to check and see if that word is fully from God or did the preacher leave you at a place where the word was incomplete. Because even when God corrects and rebukes, when it's all said and done, God will build you up. 
He will make you strong. He will give you a sense of hope. I should never come to church and leave down and in despair and hopeless. This is why I'm concerned by the way some of you leave every week because you can come and sit on the seat but you haven't connected with God. Because when I talk to some of you after service, you have the same down, dreary, depressed mindset that you came in with. And a true test and measure on if you have been in the presence of God is there should be an exchange that takes place. Isaiah said, I'll give you a garment of praise in exchange for a spirit of heaviness. God help a church where everybody walks out of the door at 12 noon just as depressed and just as much despair, just as hopeless as when they walked in. Either they didn't connect or the church needs to shut down. But when I have an encounter with God, light shines into darkness. Hope arises in my soul. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I thought it was impossible when I walked into church, but by the time I got through leaving, I recognized that with God, all things are I thought my marriage was dead, but by the time the preacher got done preaching about the resurrection, I declare my marriage shall come back to life. I thought the doctor's notice and his terminal diagnosis was everything, but when I heard a few stories about a man from Galilee with enough healing in his garment, To set me free. So he says, preach the word. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. With great patience, take time for the people to learn. It may take time for the word to change the people. Hearts become hard. So with great patience and careful instruction. So he says the basis of the charge of Jesus is returning. Now look at verse number three. We see the second basis for the charge. Watch what he says. For the time will come. This is what I was talking about. I got ahead of myself. When people will not put up with. You can be seated. We just got a little more to go. The time will come. When people will not put up with. Sound doctrine. So the basis of this charge to preach, he says, number one, Jesus is returning. Number two, he says, preach on the basis of the contemporary scene. He says, I'm charging you to preach because we are in an era. It has begun in Paul's day, and now it's on steroids in our generation where now it's no longer what God says. It's what God says and what I say. And if what God says and what I say begin to intermingle and begin, and, and I don't yield to the word of God, this is why I was saying, parents, it's a nasty word. We don't hear enough yields. When I said you yield to God and to the teachings and principle of the Bible, you may have an opinion, but yield. You may have an idea, but yield. Somebody's got to yield to the word of God. And he says the sign of this generation is there's going to be a time where they're going to tell you, adjust your message. Change your sermon. You're offending everybody. And I'm not talking about right, left, Democrat, Republican, black, yellow, red, white. Because if you truly preach the word of God, you will be standing by yourself and nobody will like you. The word of God, the true gospel, I'm not talking about the one that the Republicans or anybody, I'm talking about the true gospel. It'll offend a Democrat. It will offend a Republican. It will offend a liberal. It will offend a conservative. It will offend the gay. It will offend the straight. It will offend the bisexual. It will offend the transgender. It will offend the Caucasian. It will offend the black. It will offend the red. It will offend the yellow. 
The true gospel of God pulls no punches. It cuts everybody down to bone and marrow. Who will be able to stand? So he says, based on the contemporary scene, he says, preach the gospel. Because the time is coming where they won't put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Then verse number four, they will turn their ears away from the truth Turn aside to myths, but you keep your head. Let's stay here for a second. Keep your head in all situations. So he gives three bases for this charge. Keep that up. He says, number one, Jesus is returning. Number two, the contemporary scene, the signs of the times are the basis for this charge. And then the charge number three comes from the fact that I am getting ready to die. And I want you to see it. I don't want you to just read the words. I want you to hear the voice, the tone. Because up to this point, many of you soldiers, we celebrated Veterans Day yesterday and Tad Day's off, Friday off this week. Many of you know this. Up to this point, it takes on a, a milit it has a militaristic, a militarized tone, the tone of a drill sergeant. Even here, I charge you, suffer for the gospel. Yes, sir. Continue in the gospel. Yes, sir. I charge you. Preach the word. Yes, sir. Look at you even even see it here right up to verse number five. Keep your head. Endure hardship. Do the work. Discharge the duties. Read the tone. I want you to hear it how he said a militarized tone. The tone of a drill sergeant. Keep your head. Yes, sir. All sit endure hardship. Yes, sir. Do the work. Yes, sir. Discharge the duties. Yes, sir. But in the third basis, his voice begins to change. After all of this, keep your head, endure, do the work, discharge. Keep your head, endure, do the work, discharge. Verse number six, things begin to change. If your Bible reads like mine around verse number nine, it'll say something in the heading of personal remarks. And the personal remark of Officially begin at verse number nine, but you begin to see the voice change around verse number six because now I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And it goes from this, yes, sir, I charge you, guard the gospel, continue the gospel, do the work, discharge the duties, yes, sir, to I am already being poured out like a drink offering. It's in this fourth charge in chapter four that he makes a turn in his tone. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And he gives two vivid metaphors, two word pictures right here. He gives a drink offering. And he more than likely, what I believe, is he's using the metaphor of a boat being released from its moorings. A boat being released. Too much to do about some nerd stuff, some Greek stuff you don't hear about. But nonetheless, I believe more than likely he's using the picture first and foremost of a drink offering and then that second one for the time of my departure is near. Get in your mind now a drink offering being poured all the way out. He uses this picture as to show his death is imminent, so imminent where it has already begun. 
Perhaps he was laying away, wasting away in this cell, only given so much food. Perhaps he's beginning to become emaciated. He can count some more ribs than he could this time last week, last month. He recognizes that, that this is the end. God is not getting me out of this. His delivering out is going to be delivering through. I am going to die here. This is not the snake bite that I shake off into the fire. This is not the boat that I get to step on one of the pieces and make it all the way across. This is not the demons chasing after me and leading people to stone me and I get up and I keep on preaching. No, this is the one that does take me out. This is the one I'm not going to recover from. And we preach on this all the time. The life of a believer must carry balance. I must hold both truths in both sides of my hand. That he can and he will deliver. But if he doesn't, is he yet and still God? So he says, I'm already being poured out. And the time of my departure is near. So since I'm being poured out. And my boat has been released from its moorings. The anchor has been weighed. The ship has set sail for eternity shore. I'm being put out to sea, so to speak. So he says, I'm being poured out, and I'm being put out to sea. The time of my departure is near. In light of this, he says, here's what I want you to do. Verse number seven. He says about his life, he says, looking back over things, he says, now that I give you these charges and I take on a militarized tone, I'll just be real with you. I don't have time to play. And it's something about when you approach death or old age. You don't have time. I was telling the church yesterday about a funny story that I had sitting with Mother Daly at her house. And she said some things to me. And they started laughing. And that's one thing I do love about seniors. They don't waste a lot of time with words. It's something about when you start getting over 60, 65, 70. If I put my grandmother's phone conversations up here, y'all would be like, oh, my goodness, to hear my 90-year-old grandmother speak because it's like once you hit a certain age, you don't waste a lot of time sitting with Mother Daly, 98 years old. I don't have a lot of time to waste with you. Let me tell you how I feel, what I do like, what I don't like. Let me tell you about my strengths and my weaknesses. I don't have time to couch it in pillows of nice words. The time is near. I've been blessed to stick around long enough to see the change, the maturation, the, the evolution of Apostle Madison's pastoral strategies and communications. I remember 30 and 40 and 50 year old and, and things came out a little nicer. But now at 70, I notice he kind of gets to the truth a little quicker he cuts right to it I don't have a lot of time I've stood at death's door I don't want to waste a lot of words let me just give you the truth when he says it up here to us Pastor Gabriel talk nice to you he's a little but I just got to give you the truth it's something about when you've been knocking at death's door when you take life more seriously so he said I don't have a lot of time to waste here I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Any day now when Nero says the word, they're coming in my cell to chop my head off. It could be tomorrow. It could be a week from now. But the time for my departure is near. And I pray that God would give every single one of us a sense of when our departure is near. You may not know the exact day. You may not know the exact hour or the exact moment. But do like Moses wrote. God, teach us to number our days. Give me a general sense, a general understanding that I don't have as many days as I did before. So I won't waste a lot of time. I won't drag my feet. I'll know what to say yes to and what to say no to. I'll be more advantageous with my time. I'll take advantage and seize opportunities a little more because I know how much time that I have. Teach us to number our days. Says the time of my departure is near. So he gives two metaphors and I want to deal with the second one. He says three things. He says I fought a good fight. 
I've kept the faith. And he says here, I have, watch this, finished the race. You'll see this over and over again in scripture uh, where he uses these two examples back to back. Military examples versus the examples of a race. I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. You don't have to turn there now, but write down. Even in, in chapter, I believe it's two, around verse number three, where he gives an example of a soldier. Then he gives the example of athletics. And over and over again, not just in this book, but Paul uses the metaphor of athletics. There is an aspect of athletics and competition that is analogous to our faith walk. But more than that, he uses wrestling in some places. You'll see him use boxing in some places. But more than any other metaphor, you will see him use the metaphor of track and field. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. There are aspects of our Christian walk that are analogous to a race, a running. If anybody hurt you, what's the matter with me? Tell them I'm saved and sanctified. Holy Ghost filled and water baptized. I've got Jesus on my side. Lord, I'm running. Trying to make 100. 99 and a half in the end. But I've got to keep running. Trying to make 100. Paul says it's a race. You'll see it in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 7. He starts talking to the church in Galatia. He likens it to a race. He says, you are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Who stepped in your lane? That's not the only place. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Verse number, I believe, is 24. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? So here's how your faith walk should be. Run in such a way that you get the prize. Verse number 25, because everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we will do it to get a crown that will last forever. Verse number 26. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. And we will stick with the running right now. But actually, he goes on. Now he switches to the metaphor of boxing, of shadow boxing. He says, I don't do it like someone shadow boxing. I strike a blow and I make every blow count. But he says, do not run like someone who's running aimlessly. What about 1 Timothy, the first letter he wrote to him? Chapter 4, verse number 7, he says, have nothing to do with, what, with godless myths, old wives tales. Watch this, train yourselves to be godly. The Greek word there, train, is, I believe it's gymnasio, gymnasio, I'm not a Greek guy, but it's where it enters our English language as gymnasium, train, and the word literally means in the Greek to train naked, or at least to train scantily clad. To train with either nothing on or next to nothing on because you want nothing to hinder your movement as you are running. Come here with me, y'all. If I understand that, now I understand Hebrews 12, verse number 1. Therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off. Anything, gymnasio, train naked, scantily clad, anything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. Why do I need to do this? Am I doing this because I'm boxing? Am I doing this because I'm fighting? No, you got to do this and let us. Hooray. 
race. You don't know it or not. Your faith walk is a race. Let us run the race that is set before us. Stay here. Now let's take it a step further. I got to go, y'all. I'm up against it. But it's not just a race. Watch me here. Let's take it a step further. He uses this metaphor that I have finished the race. I want to take it a step further. I think it is not the fact that it's a race, but it's the type of race. I believe the Christian walk is analogous or similar to a marathon. I'm going to show you it here in, in the Word. Stick with Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Watch this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we don't know who wrote this, but in your mind, get a picture of the Olympics. It started in Greek culture. Okay, this is, and whoever wins, they get the crown of Olympia. Remember, our state capital. It's named after all of it, the crown of Olympus. And so they would compete in these games. So he uses this metaphor from this contemporary content. Get in your mind now, the crowd is around you for the game. And he says, you are now running, throw off everything that hinders, and let us run. Watch this. How are we going to run? With perseverance. Perseverance. Let's look at it at another place. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 12. I'm taking you through this word. Now that I have already obtained all, not that I have already obtained all of this, I have already arrived at my goal. But look at his words here. He uses this again. But I press. Perseverance and press, press and perseverance. One trace he'll read, it'll say endurance. Let us run with endurance, but let us run with perseverance and to press. You don't need a press and a perseverance for a 100 meter. That's a quarter of the way around the track. You don't need a press and a perseverance for a 200 meter. That's halfway around the track. You don't even need a press and a perseverance for a 400 meter. That's one time around the track. That's 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 meter. A 100 meter race lasts 10 to 15 seconds. For a 100 meter race, what you need to make sure of more than anything is that you get off to a good start. 100 meters are about starting. I feel like preaching here. 100 meters are about getting out of the blocks right. 100 meters are about not jumping the gun so you're not disqualified. It's about getting off to the right start, getting your right footing on the ground, establishing your lane, and pushing at the right time. But when it comes to a marathon, I'm going to need a press. I'm going to need a run with perseverance. Marathons are 26.2 miles. I don't need a press when I'm running for 15 seconds. I don't need a press one time around the track. But when I get to mile 6 and mile 8 and mile 10 and mile 13 and I recognize I'm just halfway through the course and everything in my natural body is telling me to shut down and quit, I'm going to need something on the inside that runs a little deeper than my natural body and can move me to the place where I keep going. This faith walk is not a, oh, glory to God, a sprint. It's a marathon. And the problem is we are entering this faith walk with a sprinter's mentality. And we are not recognizing that our faith walk is a marathon. Not only our faith walk, we enter things with the sprinter's mentality. I told you this before recently we were talking about it. I had no plans of preaching this, but I see God was already giving me the inklings of what I'm preaching here today. Sprinters look better. Their muscles look better. Look at Usain Bolt in his prime. Look at Michael Johnson in his prime. Look at Jackie Joyner Curse in his prime. The sprinters, the muscles are good. Their vascularity looks good. Their abs are great. I dare you to go look at the body of a marathon runner. They don't retain muscle the same because they do so much cardio. 
not the cute, the ugly vascularity going through all of their legs and feet. Most of their feet and their toenails are all black because all of the fungus of sweating in those shoes after running all of those miles for so many. Black toenails, ugly feet, corns and bunions, veins all throughout their legs and body. Aspects of their body are skinny. Some look emaciated in some part. Marathon runners aren't cute. And we enter things with a sprint mentality. We enter marriages with a sprint mentality. And we sprint up the aisle. We sprint up before the preacher. And we don't recognize that the wedding was the sprint. But the marriage is the marathon. If y'all just give me five more minutes, I promise you, I'm going to close this out. We enter ministries with a sprinter's mentality. I'm a sprint to the altar. The preacher's going to sprint to lay hands on me. But this faith walk is going to be a marathon. What if you have a sprinter's mentality but a marathon problem? That child's not going to be straight overnight. One prayer and some oil may not do it. Parenting is a marathon. This idea that I've had my children for 18 years and I'm done. I need to call my mother and father now more than I ever have in my life. How do I do this? How do I do that? How do I stop from killing this child before they say something crazy one more time? I need help. You're not going to parent me at just five, six, and seven. You're going to have to parent me at 40, 45, and 50. It's a marathon. Your life is devoted to this for better or for worse, for sickness and in health. Till death do you part. We want to invest money with the sprinter's mentality. NFT's crypto, you can get it overnight. I promise you it'll come fast. It's crazy promises. Take this 2,000, it'll turn into 2 million in two months. Sprinter's mentality. The best and most genuine blessings that God has for us in this life all require a marathon mentality. And Paul says, I have ran my race. I have finished my course. And you have to run in a way that you have a marathon mindset. That I am in it for the long haul. So I, can, I can't gas out the first year, the first minute, the first seconds of the race. I have to run in a way that I can have enough left. The technical term in track and field is called running economy. That's the technical term. It's called running economy. Running economy is your ability to save energy for the latter parts of the race. The more efficiently you use oxygen to maintain your pace, the longer you are able to sustain your effort. And the problem is we go into things thinking they'll take a year or two, a month or two, a day or two, and we gas out, and all of a sudden we don't recognize, wait a minute, this thing was a marathon. was not a sprint so if I'm going to make it to the point where I can say like Paul in my faith walk I have finished my race 30 years in the ministry Timothy I've had some ups I had some downs but I have finished some people didn't like me. I've had to go out of cities just to save my life, let down in baskets on city walls, stoned. People beat me up, punched in my face, being spat on. Everything I've endured at all, snake bites and shipwrecks. But how can I get to the place where I can say, I have finished my race? Oh, if you don't know anything, recognize Paul as a finishing model. And we put so much emphasis on startups, start business startups, starting a ministry, starting a church, starting a job. But it's one thing to go to the charge of continue. And now another thing entirely to go to the thing of finish. 
It takes a grace to finish, an anointing to finish. So if you're going to finish, I'm going to give you these three things and then I'm going to go. Number one, you must aim to finish. Aim to finish. If you're going to finish, you must aim to finish. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse number 23. Number one, aim to finish. Acts 20, verse number 23, and then we'll hasten to our close. This is Paul talking. This was always at the forefront in his mind. Look at this. I only know, watch this, that in every city, Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Watch this. My only aim, there it is again, is to finish the race. He went into it with an aim to finish. If you want to finish something, go into it with an aim to finish. An aim to finish. They say directors do this in movies. I used to think directors write movies in sequence, but that's actually not true. Most of the time they go through and they shoot the ending of the movie. Then they go back and shoot all of the scenes that lead up to it. So they start the filming with the ending in mind. How am I going to finish this thing? Things may get crazy at the top, but if I can bring it to the finish. I'm aiming to finish. This is why people look at me crazy when they say you're just getting started and you're already talking about the next guy. I'm trying to enter into the door with an aim to finish. I'm only here for a window in time. I am not the chosen frozen who will last here forever. Just like every minister before me, God will give me my 20, 25, 30 years and after that it's time to hand it to the next guy. So you must go in the door with an aim to finish. Start your business and how will this thing continue? Stand at the altar and say, how do I want our marriage to look in 30 years? It's an exercise I do every now and then in marriage counseling where I ask the couple out the way, where do you see yourselves? Where would you like to see yourself as a couple in 25, 30 years? You're going in it with an aim to go the distance. What do you want it to look like in year 20, 25, 30? And what can you do now to work toward that outcome? Because if your habits now don't match that outcome, you're on your way to an unexpected end. But you got to go into it with an aim to finish. So number one, aim to finish. The grace to finish, if I'm going to finish something, I must aim for it. Number two, run your race. Run your race. Run your race. Run your race. Another note I have here was stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. I was in and out of Hebrews 12. Let's go back to it. I danced between Hebrews 12 and 2 Timothy for our passage today, but I settled here. But look what he says here. Let us throw off everything that hinders. We're surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses. And let us run with perseverance. The race, what? Marked out for us. I cannot run your race. You cannot run my race. You can only run the race that is marked out for you. You may be running at a faster pace than me, but just because you finished first doesn't mean I'm not a marathon runner. The fact that I ran the 26 miles means I ran the marathon. So if you get there quicker, God bless you. But I've got to run the race marked out out for me. A lot of churches are doing a lot of things, but St. John, touch that neighbor next to you and say, we're going to run our race. We may not look like the church up the street, but we're going to run our race. We may not look like the church round the way, but we're going to run our race. There's an anointing and a work that God has for us to do, and I'm going to run my race. Run your race. It's marked out for you. Finally, number three, don't turn around. Don't turn around. I'm going to hasten to my close. Don't turn around. Don't turn around. Don't turn around. Don't. Philippians 
this. He says, I press. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind me. I used to treat this in track. I ran track in middle school and wasn't the best track runner. I did okay. But track is more so for those who are longer with longer strides. Short little guys. So I didn't do that good, but I was okay. Run my, won my share of races. But I remember that in track. I would be running in practice or even at the track meets. And every now and then, when you got the lead, you get a general sense, are they gaining on me? Because I would have trouble gassing out. And I would put everything into the start, and I would get to going, but I wouldn't have enough left to finish. So my mom was at one track meet one time. It was at, it was at uh, Lincoln High School at the time. <coughs> and she said, I noticed when you run around the track, at the end where everyone sprints to the finish, you don't sprint to the finish. You got to push to the finish. And I tell her, I, I really don't have anything left <laughs> to sprint to the finish. She said, you got to finish. But I would get to the point where I would run, and every now and then, I would turn and do like this. Because I want to see if they're gaining on me. And if so, by how much? And our coaches would bark at us so hard. Don't you? They say it in colorful ways. <laughs> Madison, what the, what are you doing? Don't, I told you over and over, don't turn around. You know, they'd never have that nowadays. Kids would run off the field crying. Everybody gets trophies now, you know. <laughs> 18th place, here you go. But... But he would bark us off. I told you so many, don't turn around. Every time you turn around, he says, you lose a second and a half to two seconds. He said, even if you feel him gaining on, you got to get to the place where you keep pushing. And on the turn, if you want to take a look, see what's in your rear view on the turn. But whatever you do, as you're running forward, don't turn around. You even see Olympians do this, where they'll use one of the cameras in the arena and they'll try to look up while they're running, but they're trained and they're taught, whatever you do in the race, do not turn around. You lose time. And amongst Olympians who are normally no more than a second, a millisecond, a second and a half and apart, you turning around can lose you the race. So Paul uses this metaphor. He says, I'm straining toward the finish line when he wrote to the church in Philippi. He says, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget everything that is behind me. And I'm going to strain toward what's ahead. If you're going to finish, don't turn around. Some of you in this room, God has you here for a purpose. You've been coming, and the faith walk will go through peaks and valleys. God shows himself stronger in certain seasons than he does in others. And we will have seasons where we feel like we're going to go back. Do things the old way. Make money the old way. Rub elbows the old way. Do things I used to do. Don't turn around. It's a marathon. There's going to be days it's not going to be pretty. You're only in mile eight, mile seven. But if you stay the course, you will finish your race. I declare that God is giving us the grace to finish. That we are going to stand unique in this generation as a church. We're going to be a group of people who finish things, who are consistent and continuing things. I'm not so much concerned about quantity right now as I am quality. Not that I don't want God's church to grow. It will grow. But as people come in, go out, come in, go out. As like an airport, so to speak, planes go in, go out, go in, go out. Only time it should be packed is if every plane is grounded. So there should be some coming in, going out. If we're flying and really doing this thing, things are going to be coming in, going out. But if we stay around 200, 300, I'm more interested in quality. 
Are we making quality disciples with staying power? What's the sign of a quality disciple? They stay. They stay. They stay in church when the message wasn't for them that week. Surprise, not everyone is going to be for you. When the ministry doesn't have nothing to meet, quote, unquote, my needs. Surprise, not everything is going to be for you. You have to adjust your mindset in this marathon. I'm no longer a receiver. I'm now a giver. So it's not so much what does the church have for me, but the mindset should shift. What can I do through the church? Because I'm in a marathon. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the grace to finish. I thank you that we have an aim to finish. We have goals that we've set for the end of this year. I pray, Father, that, and I thank you in advance that you are giving us the grace to finish. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would help us not to turn around. Help us to run the race marked out for us. Help us not to compare ourselves with our brother, our sister. Blessings that we all of a sudden used to be in awe of can become small, minute, when we compare them to someone else. So, Father, I pray that the curse of comparisons would not be in the hearts of your people, but they would run the race you have for them. Thank you for the unique work you have for each person here. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come on and stand on your feet. Let's give God praise for his word this morning. Come on, let's give God praise for his word this morning. If you can hold your seats for just a moment, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here, you're outside of relationship with Jesus Christ, and you say, I want Jesus as Lord of my life. I may have not recognized or under, fully understood everything that was said. That would be foolish of me to think that. But I understand the seed of what you were saying, Pastor Gabriel. That this, this faith walk is a marathon. And so this sobering description of what faith in Christ and Jesus, a relationship with Christ is all about, is something I'm ready to anchor myself to. I want to run with Christ Jesus it is a run. There's going to be days that are going to be tough. You're going to be tired. But the Bible promises something. He says, I'll renew you day by day. There's a renewal that takes place through Holy Spirit. This is why we come here on Sunday morning. This is our gathering to catch our collective breath and go out and keep running. On Wednesday nights, we watch and learn the word and lessons online to study and stay in the scriptures. We practice the spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting and biblical meditation. These are ways that God has given us and blessed us to collectively catch our breath and keep running. I'm not promising you it's going to be easy, but I'm promising you there's a God who loves you, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. And he rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he conquered death. And through faith in him, he will separate us from the penalty of our sin. The penalty of our sin, of the things we do wrong, is eternal separation from God. Eternally separated. But when Jesus came, he said, I came to reconcile the relationship with you and God my Father. So when you put your faith in what I've done, don't try to do it on your own. There's no philanthropic effort. There's no, many, there's no alms that you can do. There's no natural work that you can do. Just put your trust in what Jesus has done for you. Turn away from your way of doing things and say, God, I want to begin to do things your way according to the Bible and to its teachings. So I'm coming to relationship with you. If that's you in here, while these heads are bowed, these eyes are closed, will you shoot your hand up in the air wherever you are? We have ministers in the room watching, looking, waiting for you to raise your hand. They'll come to you individually and just whisper a prayer with you. We'll exchange some brief information after service. We'll explain to you what it means to enter into a relationship with Christ. Thank you, G. I see you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wherever you are, lift your hand up wherever you are. If that's you, I want Jesus in my life. 
Pastor Gary, I've been trying to run this life race on my own naturally, and I'm just tired. I found out the only way I'm going to win this thing is I've got to run with Jesus. So I want him in my life. If that's you, slip your hand up wherever you are. If that's you, slip your hand up wherever you are. These heads are bowed. These eyes are closed. The church is praying. We're getting ready to celebrate baptism in just a few moments. If that's you, lift your hand up wherever you are. Baptism service is on the lower level immediately following this worship service. Take a break, converse with somebody in our church, say hello to them, and then join us on our lower level. Evangelist Bobby Coleman will be leading us in the word. And we'll celebrate the new births in our faith. Amen. But before we do that, if that's you, I want Jesus in my life. Or I just get this sense in my spirit, Pastor Gabriel, I'm just running and I've been tired. If that's you, come to my left, to the right of this stage. I've been running and I just need to be renewed. Be honest, don't lie to yourself. I've been running. I have been running and I'm tired. Not tired, I'm tired. I just need to be renewed. I'm just at a place right now where I am tired. I'm right there with you. I'll stand with you. There are aspects of it that are good, but the aspects are I'm tired and I just need Holy Spirit to renew us. The Bible promises that he will. Though the outward man is wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day, the Bible says. The Bible says, they that wait, hope, trust in the Lord, renew their strength. There's another gear that you can run in in your faith walk. Holy Spirit, Ruach, the breath of the Holy Spirit, the oxygen of the Holy Ghost is coming into your spirit right now giving you another wind. We declare over these people, Father, a, a second wind, a fresh wind. Thank you. I wanted you to come. I had you in mind. We declare over your people a second wind, a fresh breath of wind, a breath of fresh air of the Holy Ghost over the lives of your people. You said you'd never turn us away when we come. So I thank you, regardless of how many times we've already come, we can never stop coming. You'll always allow us to come to you. Thank you that we are your children. And you said, suffer the little children to come to me. So, Father, we love you now. Bless these people who've taken this faith step and have come. I pray that the Holy Ghost has given them fresh wind for the next phase and season of their life. Where many of them may be tired, maybe in parenting, grandparenting, tired in their job or in their workspace. Some of them may be tired and other out in their relationships, whatever it is. Maybe it's a faith fight. Perhaps it's a fight maybe with addiction or a, a, a habitual sin. And Father, it seems like they have it one day, but then the next day it has them. Father, we thank you that you are renewing them in the fights. Thank you, Father. Greater are you that's in us than he that is in the world. So, Father, we love you now and we thank you. Thank you that everything that's fighting them gets tired. I hear that in my spirit. You said in Matthew 12 that when demonic forces leave a place, they go looking for somewhere. And when it gets tired, thank you that the forces of evil that we fight get tired. Holy Spirit, wear them out. Wear the devil out. Wear the forces of darkness out. Wear them down. Put a whooping on them and renew the strength of your people. Tell them to leave your people alone. These are your people called by your name. We cover them now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the grace to finish, for finishing this year, for finishing this giving campaign. We love you and we praise you for all that you are doing. Continue to heal your people. Hold up Lady Madison before you. Hold up the sick in our church, the infirmed in our church, those dealing with bereavement in our church. Touch them right now, wherever they are. Thank you for this beautiful young lady and the baby she holds. Bless them now, God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray that all of God's people say amen.